There are only experts on what has been, but there are no experts on what will be. Now, again, that's an interesting turn of phrase, but what it means is we have to be cognizant of the fact that the way we have always done it does not work, okay? Especially in, in technology-based organizations. You were just listening to the voice of my friend and colleague, Pete Delisle. He graciously agreed to be on this episode of the show and share with you some of his thoughts and insights about the topic of leadership in times of uncertainty and complexity. Pete studies this topic, he has taught on this subject, and he has experienced this topic in his career. I know you are going to appreciate this conversation with Pete, so stay with me for the main portion of the content in this episode, number 32, of Agile Digital Business. My name is Vicki Maris. I am an author, speaker, digital marketer, and I am fascinated with the voice interface. I have been teaching about that in season two, and here in season three, I am evolving the show as you are making changes in your business, in your organization, to adjust to the needs of your customers as those needs are changing during this global crisis that's been created by the coronavirus pandemic. I think all of us are engaging with our customers, our clients, our students, our parishioners in different ways and definitely in more online ways than ever before. So the instructors, the entrepreneurs, the digital marketers and online business owners that I'm bringing to you in this season three of the podcast will be sharing their insights and their tips and techniques on how to engage with your customers or your students in those online environments, in the social channels, how to up-level your live streaming game. If you're doing Facebook Lives or YouTube Lives or Periscope broadcasts, or if you're going live on Instagram, leading your teams and leading your customers and your students through these changes is another very important aspect of all of this. And you will hear several of my guests covering topics like leadership, foresight, and innovation. I'm really excited to bring you this wealth of resources here in season three of the podcast. You will hear me intersperse the topic of voice throughout because I still think it is an important component in our overall strategy. People are leaning so heavily on audio content and the uses of their voice for search and for commerce. For that reason, I will not be going away from that subject completely. I simply wanted to evolve the show here in season three to adjust to the changes that are taking place around the world right now and how the marketplace is reacting to that. Agile Digital Business and this episode of the podcast are sponsored by Teach, Inspire, Connect. If you are interested in live streaming and how to connect with and engage your customers, your followers, your students in online platforms, such as the uses of Facebook Live, I encourage you to consider joining one of the upcoming groups. I'll read just a few sections out of Pete's bio to give you a better idea of who he is and what he brings to this conversation. Peter A. Delisle is a leadership educator and business advisor to professional organizations. His background in education includes programs in commerce, architecture, and engineering. He's a member of the executive education faculty at the University of Notre Dame, teaching in the Mendoza College of Business and in the College of Engineering. He was a program manager for the Center for Creative Leadership. He held the William B. Severance Chair in Human Behavior in the College of Engineering at the University of Illinois in Urbana, and was Professor of Industrial Engineering developing programs for leadership, interpersonal effectiveness, high-performance teams, and problem-solving. 
In addition, he has served as resource and advisor to the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, the E.M. Kaufman Foundation for Entrepreneurial Leadership, American Institute of Architects, the Department of the Army, and the LBJ School of Public Policy at the University of Texas, Austin. Pete was a human resources executive for Hewlett Packard Company and founding human resources officer for Convex Computer Corporation of Dallas. He has worked with more than 300 companies over the last 25 years and has provided direct support in leadership Greater Hartford. Pete served in the United States Army as a captain of field artillery, as a howitzer battery commander, and a legislative and foreign liaison officer. He was the distinguished military graduate from the University of Connecticut in 1971. He holds a PhD in human resource development leadership and Phi Kappa Phi from the College of Education at the University of Texas in Austin. Pete and his wife Jan live in Torrington, Connecticut. It is my honor to bring this part one conversation to you with Pete Delisle. In an upcoming episode of the podcast, he and I are going to hold another conversation for you on the subject of foresight. Now, let's go to our part one conversation, which is about leading teams in times of uncertainty and complexity. Pete, I really appreciate you being here on this episode of Agile Digital Business. Thank you so much. Vicki, it's always a pleasure to, to talk with you and spend time with you. I consider it an honor and a privilege. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. I know my podcast listeners are joining me right now in uh, being appreciative of what you are about to share with us. The topic that you bring today, leadership during times of uncertainty and during times of complexity, Oh my gosh, it's so pertinent right now. Folks, I'm recording this with Pete in April of 2020. We're in the U.S. We're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, and states are beginning to take a look at reopening their economies and getting things back running, but we're not there yet, and businesses are having to make a lot of shifts to... uh, adjust to the situation and to their changing workforce and the health of their workforce too. So Pete, I, I just really appreciate what you bring to this topic. I have heard you teach on this before in the executive classroom, which was uh, one of the reasons I asked you to be on this show. So if, if you were in the room counseling a, a small group of people who were leading a business, what, what would you be bringing to them in that moment as they were taking a look at these uncertain times? What, what, what do leaders need to be doing and thinking about right now? Well, Vicki, you know, uh, again, this is a very timely thing, obviously, for all of us. I'm, um, I think that some of the comments that I'd like to make are more general comments than specific, if I can start with that, but then we can hone down. I, I guess my first comment would be to my friends, you know, welcome to the age of discontinuity. Yes. What I mean by that is the, the world has essentially gone from simple to complex instantaneously. And what we're encountering is a massive, unpredicted or unrecognized change. And you know, sadly, the old solutions don't work. We find ourselves in a situation now where, try as we might, The way we used to do things are actually not going to be effective as we take a look at the challenges that we're facing in the future. I was reflecting on this uh, recently, and yesterday, uh, speaking to the date, was the 50th anniversary of um, Earth Day. And I recall as a a college student being on campus and kind of celebrating the fact that people are trying to embrace a, a view of the world going forward, which I thought was very promising. Sadly, about a week and a half later, we also had a a shooting at Kent State University on the 4th of May where four kids were killed and 11 were injured. Not only did that create an environment where people rose up and uh, expressed their angst and their frustration and their anger at an awful situation, but maybe you remember this, perhaps you don't, but I certainly do. Uh, Within two weeks, uh, about... 700 universities across the United States closed. 
uh, for a number of different kinds of reasons. We don't want to okay. necessarily speculate on that. But literally, as a as a twenty year old, the world changed out from underneath me. And I, I make mention of that because we're seeing that same kind of phenomenon now, where what we used to think was normal is now it doesn't even apply any further. We're we're in a situation where our lives have gone from uh, relatively straightforward and understandable because people are professionals, they work hard, they try to anticipate the future, to a situation where you know the the past practices just just don't work anymore. If that makes any sense, I've, if you don't mind, Vicky, maybe we could be you know, obviously deadly serious about this, but maybe a little lighthearted as well. But I find myself reflecting on the uh, eminent American philosopher George Carlin. That's sort of a joke. Yes, I'm smiling over here. <laughs> yeah, who who described the scenario we find ourselves in as vuja day. And in his estimation, vuja day and, and loose translation meant we've never been here before and it doesn't look at all familiar. And, I, you know, I laugh when I think about that because, you know, in context, that was funny. But in the current situation, it's a pretty fair and accurate uh, description of what we're facing. And by the way, I think George Carlin was also informed by another eminent American philosopher, Yogi Berra, uh, who said, we're lost, but we're making good time. And so uh, not to be too lighthearted about that, but I think one of the things our, our, I would advocate for our friends is to recognize, you know, that, that the old models don't work. And we need to understand what I refer to as a socio-technical system. What that means by, by way of translation is, is that the, the human factors are just as important as what we're attempting to accomplish in terms of our business. And those two things have to work concomitantly. And I, there's a paradox here, and that is that the relationship actually becomes the task. is taking care of people and ensuring that we're focused on people's viability and welfare going forward and building resiliency in our organization is not, um, does not track with shareholder value, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what I'll suggest at this moment in time and what I'd like our friends to consider is that if, if management is planning, organizing, and controlling, and we strive to approximate those things because we like to manage our organization, you can't manage uncertainty. You can't manage complexity. You have to embrace kind of as the cliche now is a new normal. And one of the ways we do that is recognizing that management may not, in fact, work because the current management models don't work. Whereas we can lead our way through this and we can try to make sense out of this complexity. I don't know. Does that make sense at all, mm -hmm. Vicki? Yes, it does. Okay. So I don't, uh, if you can give me some sense of where we might go from that kind of preamble to this conversation, I'd be grateful. Well, okay. This is going to be, I hope you're smiling or laughing on your end, but we might have a few listeners who don't know who Yogi Berra is. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> would, would you def would you let us know who that is? Because I have a feeling one of his quotes might come up later in our conversation. Well, you know, uh, Yogi Berra was a uh, an all-star uh, uh, Hall of Fame baseball player for the, uh, the dreaded New York Yankees. Um, and, and Yogi had this uncanny way of making statements that at the time seemed completely obtuse, but later on you recognize that Yogi was actually a savant. Uh, Yogi would say stuff like, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. I've already mentioned your loss, but we're making good time. Um, and again, I was teasing a little bit with that, but you know, Yogi actually, I think, was a master of dealing with uncertainty. And in that, in that particular context, uh, in that particular context, Yogi obviously was a really good baseball player. No one ever thought of, of him as a uh, as a uh, philosopher, if you will. And, and and I'd like to think of this in a lighthearted way, but in Yogi's view of the world, um, you can you can learn to tolerate uncertainty and ambiguity and respond to it effectively, or in in this case, hit for average. If you just recognize that um, the old rules don't necessarily apply all the time, and we may have to embrace, if you will, new rules. Does that make sense? It's, yeah, it certainly does. You had made an interesting comment that I took a couple notes on about how building resiliency in our organization doesn't 
always track with shareholder value. Right. Do you have any suggestions for for the businesses out there that are facing, you know, wanting to meet the needs of shareholders as well? Are there some extra steps they should be taking to communicate what's going on as they're trying to build resiliency that yeah. they communicate out with their shareholders? Or do you have any suggestions there? Well, you know, I've got, if I, again, from a general point of view, I, let me, and looking at this as, as leaders trying to deal with this complexity, I think there are two um, expressions of leadership that would be useful to consider at this moment in time. The first is, uh, in, you know, intellectual honesty. Now, what that means is that you're honest about being honest, you know, which probably sounds a little foolish, but, you know, you, you truthfully find yourself in a situation where uh, you're encountering things that you've never seen before. And so the effective leader is a person who is willing to be vulnerable and actually say things to their folks like, you know, I don't have a clue as to what's going on here, but, you know, we'll figure it out which inspires mm -hmm. a sense of confidence and trust and a sense of hope as well, which would be one of the things that would en enable people to move past this point of confusion that we're facing into a, maybe a more hopeful view of the world or more positive view. The other, the other behavior that I think is critically important in terms of this idea of resiliency, reflecting back now to the comment I made about the socio-technical system where the human factors by the way, that's for you engineers out there. The human factors are just as important as the, the work that you're doing is that the underlying value is, is human compassion, is thinking about what's going on with human beings and the full complexity of it. And so, you know, in, in so many circumstances and situations, people have said, well, you have to manage, you have to be high task, you'll sort out the human, you know, the people stuff later on, it's all good. And whatnot, and frankly, that's led to short-term success for organizations. But more often than not, these organizations extinguish themselves because they just burn people out. Um, by the way, the other side is equally as problematic, and that is when people are so worried about making sure everybody's okay and stop paying attention to what's going on in the world around them, they go out of business as well. But human compassion figures into this thing significantly because if you want to enable a group of people to do a very difficult task really well, then you have to have the capacity to do it more than once. And so the ideal circumstance we're talking about is that and we're relentless in our pursuit of trying to get the best job done we possibly can get done. You don't take your eye off the ball. On the other hand, you also build and sustain relationships to the point where people can renew their energy, continue to be productive, embrace productivity and creativity as part of their commitment to the organization going forward, and of course, the paradox in that is that relentless pursuit of excellence while sustaining effective relationships is actually, a, you know, is, is, is contradictory. It's orthogonal because when you're working on one, you're not working on the other. So the ideal circumstance here is for us to recognize that if the task is under control, you got to worry about relationship related issues and taking care of your folks. And if the relationship stuff's under control and people are okay, then you go back and concentrate on excellence and, and productivity and those types of things. But those things occupy, as I said, at the same moment in time. And so it can't be steady state. As a matter of fact, what we're looking for are organizations can do both, and yet they can't do both at the same time. So they have to kind of move back and forth or create a stated dynamic balance between these two things. Because if you're not working on task, you're working on relationship and, and vice versa. Does that make any sense at all? It it really does. And I was thinking too, as you were describing that, that as a, right now I'm an employee of a university working my way through these uncharted waters. And I find some of exactly what you're talking about, where there will be periods of time in a week where the tasks seem very much at hand. I'm getting things done, churning along. And then something unforeseen pops into my world. You know, it might be with my, something about my elderly mother that you know, I can't really attend to her needs right now because sure. she's on a lockdown in a retirement community. Oh dear. Uh, and she's, she is doing well, but thank goodness she is doing well, but it's still disconcerting to have that routine 
upended and to not be able to talk with her face to face. And I find sometimes just, I'm just you know sharing personally here that my focus I really have to work at keeping my focus on the task. And I'm thinking, man, if you've got a whole team of people and everybody's in a different state of that, yeah. we're all having those perhaps unforeseen things showing up at different times in our work days than, than what they normally would have in our, if you could put air quotes around it, our regular past. Yeah. It's it's interesting. So I, I applaud the, the leaders who are able to flex in those situations and kind of yeah. feel out what each individual needs in any given point in time during the week. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, well, you know, I hope your mom's OK. And as as we reflect on this for all of our friends, you know, I hope your families are safe and well and, and moving forward. Your comment to me is is pretty important as we look toward the future. You know, I happen to think that you know the old or the current and conventional models of enterprise really need a big rethink in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here. You know, I made I'm a you know I'm 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 not any capitalist. I'm you know I'm, I've grown up and worked in for profit organizations all my life. We want to do really good work. We want to be successful. We want to. Have, Accumulate wealth. I mean, all those things are good. On the other hand, we want to do so in such a fashion that we have the opportunity to do it more than once. And so as I reflect on organizations that become so highly focused on tasks that they lose sight of the critical component that people play in that, yeah, I'm, I'm sad for them. You know, they, they may make a short-term gain, however that might be. But in the final analysis, at what cost? You know, if you've got bodies floating in your wake, is that the way you want to be remembered? Um, now, and I say that not to be um, you know, fuzzy minded about this. I, I mean, I know that there are moments in time where, you know, the, the business goes away and, and what do you do? And so my it's my hope that we can think through this uh, with a little bit longer term view of what we're trying to accomplish you know, because profit and loss, it doesn't have an inherent value other than what we offer to it. And I have seen organizations over time that have done some things that are completely counterintuitive in terms of the conventional model of profit and loss. But because they built this capacity and this, you know, this responsive ability to, to resurrect and renew themselves going forward, they thrived and were, you know, astoundingly successful over time for periods of time when they created and sustained that sense of dynamic balance. You know, I had the good fortune to, to work for Hewlett Packard Company in the 1970s and 80s. And part of the folklore of HP was that uh, at a moment in time in the 60s, and of course, this is well before uh, you know, electronic communication and a number of other things, but at a moment in time in the 1960s, the electronic instrumentation business was starting to, to suffer. People stopped buying uh, electronic measuring devices and whatnot. And so HP was faced for the first time in their history with the prospects of significant shortfall in terms of their, their uh, financial goals. And so uh, a finance person went to, uh, to, to, to Dave and Bill, as they insisted we referred to them, and be Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett, and said, I, I, we think we need to lay off 10, about 10% of our population. Two founders of the organization said, we're not going to do that. These are the folks that helped us be successful going forward. Figure out a different way. Well, you know, that was, that was counterintuitive. It was a, a paradox. Why would you do that? It's easy just to cut 10% of your population. And then, well, we'll just hire them back when the business comes back. That, that still is conventional wisdom in some organizations. Anyway, they came back to, to Dave and Bill and they said, well, you know, I mean, this is last century history now by way of perspective. But they said, you know, if everyone took a 10 percent pay cut, we think that that would be um, then we could weather the storm here. And Dave and Bill said, nah, we got to think better than that as well. And so ultimately, as they iterated the conversation, what they came up with, and this is not a bait and switch, by the way, what they came up with was, look, if everybody takes one day off without pay every 10th day. And 
We called it the Fortnite program. If everyone takes one day off without pay, then they spend time with their family. They can do other things. Uh, but we basically have the wherewithal for a period of time to keep everybody on the payroll. And so David Bill said, let's do that. And they did. Now, the pundits, you know, the, the, the wise people in terms of financial management said, well, what a dumb idea that is. And of course, the other organizations that were beset with the same problems essentially laid people off thinking, well, we'll just hire them back. And people thought that, you know, HP was nuts. But what occurred was that the business started to come back. As a matter of fact, I think intuitively they had foresight about where the electronics industry was going. And so, yeah, it was a, it, there were lots of speed bumps for about a two-year period of time. But all of a sudden, you know, the advent of new technologies uh, created a different venue. People were needing uh, electronics communication and measuring devices. HP had, you know, a full complement of people who, by the way, on their 10th day, weren't going golfing. As it turned out, part of the folklore of the company was everybody came to work anyway. So they didn't have work, but they did have work, which means they did stuff. You know, they cleaned, they painted the building, they did inventory, they did all the other things that didn't fall into a conventional manufacturing process, but they were there and they, they were they were together and they were fortified by their continuing relationship. So when the industry came back, the other companies hired their people back and HP hit the afterburners at that moment in time, which was one of those moments that was counterintuitive, that it actually enabled them to do a breakout. So they went from being a, and also ran with a number of electronics companies to being one of the premier companies in terms of their research, their development, their, their capacity for tolerating innovation and their willingness to try new and different things going forward. Now, you, you probably don't know this, but the touch screen display was invented at a division at HP during this hiatus, this downtime. And it was a cool thing to do. And there are lots of people that said, you know, what would you do with that? And so I'll suggest that if you pick up your cell phone and you touch it, that's a touchscreen display. And of course, because they promoted this continuity of product development and this constant anticipation of that things are going to be better and there's a, a sense of the future that we can contribute to, you know, for a period of time, HP was one of the premier companies in the world. Long story, Vicky. Sorry about that. I'm so glad you told that story. It, I can, I don't know, I feel my energy changing. Like my heart is beating faster as you <laughs> share that story. The, I just, um, I've heard you tell that story before in the executive education classroom, but I hadn't heard it in a while. And what was really resonating with me is I love this idea of, first of all, keeping the employees on the payroll was a, a beautiful thing. And the idea of continuing to innovate during the downturn and, and your phrase of that they were able to hit the afterburners at that point in time when they you know were coming out of that downturn. A question I have for you related to all of that is, I really resonate with either teams or organizations or companies that are always looking to future ready and, yeah. and to you know have that if it's a group of people or a cross section of team members across many teams that are in that innovation space. I'm curious Okay, let me back up, but say I also throughout my career have been a part of organizations that would rather kind of wait and see what the what the peer companies are doing yeah. or or maybe not wait and see but make sure we're doing things that are in alignment with what the peer companies are doing. Yeah. What does it take for a company to get past that and be okay with doing something that nobody else is doing? How how do you get that Dave and Bill attitude? Yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, I, there's a lot to unpack in that question, Vicky. So let me let me um, let me uh, kind of blunder in here, and, and then we can expand for, expand from there. The you know first and foremost, and this relates back to my comment about intellectual honesty, is we you know we, we need to encourage people to recognize and understand that um, I think the cliche is 
there are no experts. There are only experts on what has been, but there are no experts on what will be. Now, again, that's an interesting turn of phrase, but what it means is that, um, you know, that we have to be cognizant of the fact that the way we've always done it does not work, okay? Especially in, a, in, tech, in technology-based organizations. Um, lots of us re reflect on Moore's Law, which in, in, I'm gonna geek out on you here, which is the uh, density and the capacity of uh, uh, electroprocessors is gonna double every 18 months now. Again, that's for my electronic engineers, uh, friends, but what it means is the ability to do things is going to is going to multiply exponentially over a period of time. Change is a constant. Again, that's a cliche. But the organization that is not willing to understand that and and build an expectation formation that change and and continuing growth and development is something that will be critical to their success and viability going forward. Might be joining a kind of a zombie nation, if you will. There are countless examples of organizations that figured, we, well, we've got this figured out. Uh, nobody's ever going to do things as well as we do. And as a result, we own the market. Uh, sadly, going back to the last century, uh, that was a mindset, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way, but that was a mindset that IBM perpetrated, which was, you know, if you buy an IBM calculator, which is what we called computers back in the day, then you'll also have to buy an IBM printer and an IBM uh, whatever, because they all work together. And that phenomenon was called proprietary operating systems. That's where people think that if they have a solution to the problem and it works really well and it's very popular and people embrace it, then that's the way that they can lock out everyone else. You know, they can, the proprietary aspect is if you don't buy it from us, it's not gonna work going forward. And for a whole bunch of time, that's the way people thought through these things. So if you bought a IBM computer, it could only talk to IBM, or if you bought an HP computer, it only talk to HP. If a, you know, you bought a digital equipment computer, those are that's a company we don't even even remember anymore. And the problem with this particular mindset was that people were were self sealing. They were closing down on their products and their development, and stopped paying attention to what was happening in the world around them. So having lived through this, uh, there were a bunch of, of young, bright men and women in colleges that back in the 19, uh, you know, the uh, late 70s and early 80s were saying, why is it so that only a computer could talk to another computer uh, that of the, is of the same uh, brand, if you will? And as a result, they challenged that and they said, you know, it shouldn't be that way. And so in kind of a Dungeons and Dragons approach to the world, which was you know, a esoteric kind of secretive game. They said, let's figure out a way for computers to be able to talk to each other. And so they developed a couple of different things, one of which was a protocol that some of you may be familiar with called Unix. And Unix was omnibus. It meant that different computing platforms could talk to each other. What, what IBM and other companies did not recognize was that was the, that was the insurgency that was going to be influential in how electronic communication was derived going forward. These young men and women went off to become parts of computer companies. And here's the point. In a four year period of time, proprietary operating systems were obsolete because everyone migrated to what we now refer to as open systems. And if a computer couldn't talk to another computer of a different brand, it was a piece of junk. Now, you know, that's an elaborate story going back 50 years in this, in this case, that suggests that those organizations that don't develop this capacity to understand and uh, develop insight into emergent things are going to find themselves not just behind, but significantly uh, running the risk of being out of business. The phenomenon we're talking about is called absorptive capacity. Now, that's not like a sponge, but it sort of is. And absorptive capacity is the ability of an organization to see and or anticipate emerging trends well in advance of others and then builds their strategies that would be responsive to emerging technologies. And of course, the, the problem is, is that those companies that don't demonstrate that behavior oftentimes find themselves um, blind to emerging activities and or passed by almost instantaneously. 
as we talk about this as a management phenomenon, uh, there's been an interesting metaphor that's been used that's called the black swan. And the black swan essentially states that everyone knows that all swans are white. Yeah, of course, until you see a black swan. Now, what that means metaphorically is once you see a black swan, you can no longer assert that all swans are white. So you literally have to change all of your thinking, all of your behavior going forward because your old models don't work anymore. Okay. And as a result of not being able to embrace that, you're going to find yourself not just not just behind, but very much will be extinguishing uh, your success going forward. And those companies actually went out of business. I can give you a countless examples of companies that did not embrace open systems. And at one point in time, they were very successful, and now they're an afterthought. So to, to your point about small companies, and I'm sorry, there's a very elaborate response to a relatively uh, straightforward question. With response to small companies, when, once you become complacent, once you believe that you have a lock on things, once you think that your product will iterate itself going forward and the world will become reliant on you, think blockbusters now. And oh, by the way, how many of you still have a blockbusters video that you can return, which now would account for about $5,000 worth of late fees? Is that once you, once you understand that these things are going to change, and in many ways they are a discontinuity, you know, the Vuja day, uh, those companies that don't understand that or are unwilling to accept it are the ones that are great, at greatest risk. And yet, of course, that doesn't necessarily fall into our normal conversation when we're doing quarterly reviews of financial performance, because our time span of control, therefore, is maybe three months, and if we're lucky, a year. And yet people to be successful going forward have to be thinking out, not just in years, but in decades, or maybe even centuries. Now, let me give you an illustration of that if I can. Certainly. B BASF is a very interesting company. And most of us recognize it because they have had clever ads on TV over the years. And their, their watchword was, we don't make the, fill in the blanks, we make it better, whatever, smarter. Now, as I looked at BASF, I said, well, that's just an enigma. What does that really mean? Because it's clever, but you know what's underlying that? And evidently, BASF has a, uh, has a strategic plan that's one sentence long. And I thought, well, that's interesting as well. And so as I read through it, the BASF strategic plan is, we want to be in business 100 years from now, which people think is just absurd. You know, what does that really mean? But in fact, it's a genius thing. First of all, because it's completely understandable. Everyone can grasp and understand what the point is. Most people don't think in terms of 100 years, but they don't have to. Because what it means is what we do every day should set us up to be in business for the next day and the next day. And of course, we'll give ourselves the freedom to think out in terms of long-term activities and whatnot. And we also may find ourselves with the capacity to drive a business as opposed to waiting for the business to happen. To us. Is, it, is this making sense, Vicki? These examples work or, or not? Yeah, they're wonderful. The That strategic plan you just mentioned is something that would be easy for every member of the company to get on board with and to memorize and to practice in yeah. whatever capacity where they're working within an organization. Thank you for letting me break into the conversation for just a moment. I want to let you know that I have another interview coming with Pete. He and I had two topics that we wanted to bring to you, and we thought it best to split them into two separate episodes. So there will be a part two interview with Pete Delisle. He and I will be talking about the subject of foresight for your business. And in another upcoming episode, I will bring you my conversation that I have had with entrepreneur and business owner extraordinaire, John Lee Dumas. He said yes to my invitation to be on the podcast, and I will be bringing that interview to you in just another episode or two. So if you are not already subscribed to the show, please do click that subscribe button in your podcast app, and I would love for you to share this episode out with a friend whom you think it would help. All right, let's get back to the rest of the conversation that I had with Dr. Peter Delisle. 
Well, you know, it means you got to be able to stop on a dime and leave nine cents change, as the cliche goes. That's what agility is the ability to be, you know, uh, responsive in an expert fashion to rapidly changing situations. And of course, you know, if we go back and look at the whole electronics and software industry over the last 40 years, those people who were successful were the ones that could rapidly change to situations in an, in an expert fashion. They provided support and viability and uh, utility, a, a product that people would actually use. And I, actually, we're seeing a manifestation of that right now. How many of us pay way too much for our uh, cable TV, television, looking at the array of things that are there, and then all of a sudden, we buy a, a new TV and we're showing Hulu and Amazon Prime and Netflix and you know the countless other apps. I made the mistake of clicking on apps the other day and I saw like 50 apps. And, and what does that actually mean? Well, the answer is there's a marketplace there. And, and at this moment in time is being driven by the fact that people are home and looking for alternatives to entertainment. And so all of a sudden when these applications present themselves, people are drawn to them and yeah, paying six bucks a month for Disney Plus or whatever doesn't seem like a lot of money. But when you're, you have four or five different apps because their proprietary operating systems don't let you watch The Mandalorian unless you have Disney Plus, uh, you find yourself pretty much handcuffed by the same mindset that IBM was involved in when it said, you know, if you have an IBM computer, you can only use an IBM computer. So history repeats itself in this particular context. I'm going to offer an ant antidote to that, if I can, uh, to the online stuff and the entertainment that we're encountering uh, on TV, and it's called a book, okay? <laughs> so hopefully reading will resurrect itself as a way of helping people find solace and grow in development in terms of, and grow and develop in terms of their, their learning and their need for entertainment or perspective on how the world operates. Charles Dickens said in The Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. The paradox exists today. As an author and a podcaster, I've seen an uptick in both of those things that uh, more people are purchasing books. Amazon provides you that data on an hourly basis. <laughs> hey, hey, Vic, have you seen Amazon telling you what books you ought to buy or yes. Netflix telling you what shows you ought to watch? Yes, I have. <laughs> that's that's a little creepy too, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but one of the other things I was going to share with you that relates to what you were sharing, I as I had in season two of the podcast, been very focused on the voice interface. There is that debate in the among the organizations and the users of the voice interface. The big players are Amazon with their. Alexa on the Echo device and then Google Home Assistant. And right now, if you write a voice app for Alexa, you have to write a different voice app for your same organization for Google Home or for Samsung Bixby. <laughs> so if you, know, if you attend those conferences, there's almost always somebody giving a talk about how there would be value if there if the uh, systems were open so that you could Precisely. put your app on any of them. Yeah. Why, why would, yeah, why, why would we do that? Can you, can you imagine, by the way, I'm old enough to be part of a generation that received its communication electronically through a sophisticated device called a radio. Okay. <laughs> and, and can you imagine what would have happened had radios been like TV channels? Now they were because, but you had to dial in, you know, the communication and whatnot, but it was interesting enough, it was all free. And isn't that a difference in terms of how we look at the world? <laughs> Sorry, that's that, that's in the weeds, but you understand what I'm getting at. I do. I do. <laughs> hey, Pete, I want to wrap this up for this episode just to, uh, to respect your time, but I would love to have you back on the show there. I know you have some more stories that my listeners would love to hear and that would help also, uh, just share the learnings that there are to be had about uh, leadership in these times. We haven't even touched on any of the great stories you have about Apollo 13. <laughs> well, you know, Vicki, I, I would be delighted to, to continue the conversation. Uh, one of the thoughts that pops into my mind immediately is perhaps another, uh, another uh, chat that we have could talk about foresight 
And I okay. made an allusion to foresight, but you know, that's an ethic of leadership. And what it means essentially is you must be thinking about the future. You must take the time. Now, which is an absurd statement because who really has the time to think about the future? But it's not in an attempt to try to predict the future because obviously we can't do that. But it's developed this capacity, this preparedness, if you will, this, this, uh, you know, this readiness, or if you want, this agility to be able to deal in an expert fashion with rapidly changing circumstances and situations, develop, develop this preparedness. And so if we could talk about foresight, because in the, the world as complex as it is, is the only way we're going to muddle our way through this is to start to think about in an optimistic and aspirational way how we're going to work through this and how we're going to you know, comport ourselves, conduct ourselves, and develop organizations for the future. So if that has merit, I'd love to talk with you about that. I would be very interested in that. And I will put it out there to my listening audience. You are more than welcome to send in your suggestion or your reaction to that topic that Pete just suggested. Uh, you can use my email address for the podcast, which is agile digital business at gmail.com. And I also have a speak pipe widget on my website where if you'd like to leave a voicemail, you can ask your question or share your comment that way. And if you'd like for us to consider including it in that upcoming episode where we would have another conversation, that would be really neat to include your voice on the show. So you could use that widget. My website is at vickimaris.com. Pete, thank you very, very much for spending this time with me and with my listeners. I always appreciate your insights and uh, the the stories that you share that bring the concepts to life. So thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, Vicki, and thanks for the opportunity. Beyond the show notes for this show, you can also find many of the resources that I mention here in the podcast when you search on the hashtags, hashtag teach, inspire, connect, and hashtag agile digital biz. I often will do posts in my LinkedIn feed, on my Facebook page, which is VJ Maris, and also in my Twitter and Instagram feeds. My handle in both of those locations is at Vicki Maris. I use those two hashtags when I'm sharing posts and tweets that have information about resources I have mentioned here in the show, or if I'm curating content for you that's related to the topics that I cover here. Will you join me now in heading out, or let's say in going online, to teach, inspire, and connect? <laughs>